Please welcome back Daniel Gordon, Stan Grant, and Adam Goods. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much. Uh, Adam, let me start with you. So this film had its premiere in Australia about a month ago, and I think is out in theaters there. Uh, what have you felt as the response to it since it's met the audience in Australia? Yeah, it's been an incredible response, um, I think, from my point of view, to share this story um, a few years after, you know, retiring was something that was quite confronting. Um, but, you know, having the right team around me to do it with Stan and Dan Gordon um, really made it quite easy and comfortable for me to do that. And I think uh, the response back home has been terrific. Um, you know, I've really enjoyed um, people stopping me in the street and wanting to give me a big cuddles. I'm a man of the people. I love... Love that. I'll be lining up outside if anyone wants to uh, do that. But uh, no, for me, it's, um, you know, it's been really positive. And you know, just being um, here in the States and Canada now um, after Telluride, it's just been overwhelming. And you know, we're absolutely blessed that everyone um, has shown up today to you know, watch it and share our, um, our journey. Uh, Stan, I want to ask you as the writer on this project about uh, Daniel as a director and, and what you think he brought to this film. You know, sometimes um, you can see a country more clearly when you live outside of it. And as a, as a journalist, that was my experience, both reporting other countries, but also living away from my own and looking back at my own country. I think what Dan brought to this was that clear eye of someone who doesn't enter that history feeling the full weight of it or living with the privilege of it, but someone who could look at something very clearly and say, that's wrong. That should not happen. And I think it's only that perspective you get from the outside that allows you to call these things out without trying to soften the blow or without trying to excuse things or also without making Aboriginal people who participated in this film feel defensive, that they had to justify and explain themselves to some sort of scepticism, that this was someone who could point a camera directly at a situation and see it with absolute clarity because he has that perspective of living away from the country. Uh, Daniel, as Cameron Bailey mentioned, the introduction, you've made a lot of sports films. And I wonder what, to you, after having studied lots of athletes, what makes Adam unique as a, as a character in one of your films? Um, I, I mean, certainly as a, as a human being, I think Adam's uh, an incredible person. Uh, from the very first time I met um, with him, um, you know, him and my two daughters are sort of like bezies, they, they call him Uncle Adam. It, you know, he's a, he's a remarkable human being. And then you, the, the, the problem I found really with, with doing this story is knowing the sort of person that Adam is to try and comprehend not just what he went through, but why are people doing this to someone who's an incredible human being? That, that's what I really, really struggled with throughout the film. Um, and, and when we were in Melbourne, I took my kids there and they were watching it sort of crying, going, how, again, like, like, Michael, um, like, like Michael O'Loughlin said, you know, it's like, what are they doing to uncle? It, it, it's a, it, it's, he's a very, very um, uh, empathetic person um, and, and just, just feels that. If, you, if he'll sit down and talk to you, he, he'll have asked you more about you than anyone else probably ever has. And um, he's more interested in other people than he is in himself. And that's what makes the reaction to him, for me, far more problematic. 
Adam, the dynamics of your story, sadly, are not unique to Australia. We can see versions of them in countries all over the world. I wonder if you've had opportunities to uh, you know, form solidarity with athletes in, in other countries who have gone through anything similar to you. Yeah, I grew up, you know, following Michael Jordan. I had all of his posters on my walls. Um, you know, I loved athletes across different codes. And um, one thing that, you know, once I went on my own personal journey to, you know, find out who I am as an uh, Aboriginal person, um, you know, I learned a lot about our history um, before and post-colonisation. And, you know, one thing that really struck home with me was, you know, just in our national anthem, um, you know, young and free, um, you know, it's just not, it doesn't really symbolise who we are as a people and, you know, I had a real, you know, problem with that and, you know, I'd have to stand up on grand final day and stand there and listen to that and, you know, to see other athletes, um, you know, like Colin Kaepernick and people who, you know, use their position um, in sport to, you know, have a voice but at that point, you know, make a statement. Um, you know, really helps empower other athletes and other people in our community to have a voice and have that courage. And I think, you know, seeing what was happening around the world, no doubt gave me the courage to keep standing up and keep representing and, you know, my morals and my values, um, which were really important to me. And, you know, I hope that, you know, if there are athletes out there who feel so strongly about something that they, they do um, have the courage to find their voice or to make a stand because without us making a stand, then unfortunately, history is going to keep repeating itself and good people, like good people come out today, um, we're going to be the ones that are, that are going to suffer because of that. Um, so by finding that voice can really, really help and, and be courage courageous. Uh, let me take some questions from the audience. take some questions from the audience. I'll uh, call on you. I'll just ask you to stand up and keep it short so I can repeat your question. Yes, uh, back there, please stand up. So the question was, how hard was it to involve Andrew Bolt in the project? We've begun, begun to uh, call this the Bolt question. Um, uh, it, it was it was hard and not hard, if that makes sense. Um, it, it doesn't really matter for me and, and Stan has a very, very good voice on this as well, but for me, and Adam, um, for, f it, I don't have to agree with you to, to necessarily put you into the film, if that makes sense. So I felt that the, the voice that's there, that's there all the way through all, that, all those years and before and unfortunately after as well, to get him in to see if he's changed at all or to see if he rigidly sticks to that side, um, and it, yeah, I just, I just felt that he needed to be in there, no matter how uncomfortable that might be for a lot of people watching. It has a lot more resonance in Australia because he is very prominent in Australia. Um, but he, he's given the, the other view, as is um, Eddie Maguire, but I think you've got... Look, I, I think it would have been disingenuous not to have him. That was a view represented at the time. He spoke for a minority, but not an insignificant minority. Um, of Australians. I think what's really important in the film is the juxtaposition of those voices. On the one hand, you have voices of First Nations people who are defiant and strong and courageous and proud and telling the truth as it appears to us, what Australia looks like to us. And then you have the voice of people like Andrew Bolt who give us Australia through their eyes. And for an audience, and all of you here today will take something away from this, you get a chance to hear those two voices and you get a chance to make up your mind as to which one speaks to the soul of Australia or not. Take a question right here. So do you have a goal in mind for the coming generation? I should say the coming generation. Adam, you have an infant uh, here with you. So what are your hopes for the, the worlds that your child will grow up in? I'm moving to Canada, so it's <laughs> sort of... Uh, <laughs> 
I think, you know, as a parent now, I look at my mum and I think of the sacrifices she made to make sure that I lived in a better world than what she did and that's the responsibility that falls on my shoulders. Um, and I like to think I've been putting some things in place to make that world a little bit better um, for young Adelaide to grow up in. I think the, the biggest thing for us in our country is about actually getting an Indigenous voice to government. Um, that's our... Um, massive cause at the moment. We've, we've tried to get constitutional recognition. Um, that wasn't met too well by the government. We're, we're now trying to you know, get that voice to, to Parliament so that we can have a professional elected body that can give expert advice on Indigenous issues. Who would have thought? Indigenous people giving expert advice on Indigenous issues. So that for me is the first step and from there you know, we can talk about constitutional recognition, we can talk about treaty, we can talk about sovereignty, um, and hopefully, you know, it falls into place once we get that voice. Um, you know, after having seen the film, you'll have some awareness now of the history that led up to that moment when Adam was booed, and it's interesting to reflect on the position of Australia, which is an outlier, even in terms of imperialism and colonisation. In Canada and in the United States, there is an acknowledgement of the sovereignty of First Peoples. Um, there are treaties which acknowledge that sovereignty, however difficult and however dishonoured many of those treaties may be. There is a fundamental acknowledgement that this was First Nations people's land. That has never been the case for us. We are the only Commonwealth country not to have signed a treaty with First Nations people. We do not have, as Adam said, recognition of our place, in our constitution as the first people of Australia. We don't have a voice in our own affairs, unlike here where First Nations people have a voice in their affairs. So we are, I think the overriding story of Australia has been one of assimilation, that we will be absorbed, this was the phrase that was used by government, we would be absorbed into the Commonwealth and that absorption was often a forced absorption, taking people away as happened in my family, as happened to Adam's mother. So there has never been in Australia a fundamental recognition of the distinct and unique place of First Peoples. We form part of an Australian nation without a fundamental acknowledgement of sovereignty. And that remains probably at a political level the single big biggest impediment to telling the truth and opening up a pathway to reconciliation that is based on mutual respect rather than assimilation. Okay, who's uh, coming? Hand up right here. Hi, thank you so much. Stand up so we can hear you better. Yeah. Uh, so she's asking as an Australian about the pictures we mm. see of people in chain yeah. gangs and, and why those pictures are so rare. When a country is founded on the idea of terra nullius, the idea of emptiness, that this was an empty land and that First Peoples had no rights to that land, that rights were extinguished and at the moment the British flag was planted, we became British subjects. If you don't see a people, how can you hear a people? If you don't see a people, how can you tell the story and the history of those people. So the story that we grew up on was that Captain Cook discovered Australia, uh, that this was a peaceful settlement, and that as Aboriginal people we just faded from the frontier. And that is not the truth of Australia. We're in the process now of asking for something again you've had in Canada, a truth and reconciliation process, where you get to bring those stories to public attention in a way that is hopefully cathartic and healing and leads to that mutual respect. But it, it comes down to the fundamental premise of the establishment of modern Australia, the settlement, the invasion of modern Australia, that effectively, for legal purposes, Indigenous people were not there. If you don't see a people, 
How can you hear a people? Here in the red, that's you. So the question is about the shift that took place after Stan's speech and why that wasn't enough to create an environment for you to keep playing football. I think for me, you know, I'd, I'd been playing for 18 years. I knew that this environment wasn't uh, an environment that I wanted to keep uh, myself in. Um, physically, emotionally, I knew that there was time to, to move on. Um, for me to have stayed would have been a detriment to my own mental health and for me, what I've learned in my whole career was that I'm always in control. I've been in control of how my body is, the fluids, the food that I put into my body to get the best out of myself. And I knew that I could no longer do anything to stop the booing or to stop the influence of the media saying what they're saying. Um, so I knew once I came back from having that week off, I had six games to go. I get through that two hours. I had five, five games to go. And I was literally counting down the hours. Okay, that's only 10 hours to go, eight hours. It was like subjecting myself to that environment. Um, because I tell you right now, not one person that's ever booed me at the footy ground has actually come up to me and told me to my face or booed me in my face. Um, because they, they are faceless and it is that pack mentality, unfortunately. So um, for me, I just knew it was time. Um, and there was nothing I could do that the football club could do um, or even the other players in the league who are absolutely fantastic um, to, to change what was happening. Um, just hope that you know through watching um, the Australian dream and educating our people back home and around the world that this sort of stuff doesn't happen again. Yeah, there's that old saying, isn't it, that um, for tyranny to flourish it takes good people to do nothing. And sadly, we're reminded of this all around our world. And that's what struck me when I came back from overseas where I'd seen conflict that was rooted in tyranny and the legacy of very divisive histories and very violent histories still at play in people's lives. And um, in Australia, even though there were people of goodwill and people who wanted to stand with Adam, there is a reluctance of people to speak back against tyranny. And uh, it was very obvious to me that something had to be said and something had to be written and I would have felt an absolute um, coward and I would have felt it was an abdication of my own voice and responsibility not to do something. But it's amazing what happens when you step up because other people are then emboldened and it gives courage to their voices. And I think those voices spoke ultimately more loudly than the people who booed Adam. And as Adam said, you know, surely the right of all people is to choose your time and your path. And that's the ultimate victory in a sense, or the strength of Adam is that he didn't go away from the game on anyone else's terms, but his own. Uh, we... We have to uh, wrap up this conversation. This is the first uh, screening in Canada. I think there's a lot of distributors here at the Toronto Film Festival who are watching this film and asking, can this film play outside of Australia? I think this audience has given. I want to thank you for coming. Thanks especially to Daniel Gordon, Stan Grant, and Adam Goods. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.